If I give you a million planets like Earth, a lot of them are going to have life. Now, the question of whether they have intelligent life is another discussion point, if you will, because whether you get intelligence just because you have life, that's an open question. Hello. Hi. How are you? Well, uh, I'd say at least mediocre, maybe slightly <laughs> better. Maybe not. So why are you only mediocre? Well, uh, o- only because normally I'm sort of worse than that. But this is not a bad day so far. <laughs> so it's a step That's up. Funny. That's funny. I like it. I like it. So who are you? Well, my name is Seth, Sugar Echo Tango, Hawaii. And I'm uh, an astronomer, the senior astronomer, actually, at the SETI Institute in California. Uh, we look for life in space. Search for extraterrestrial intelligence. That's what SETI is the acronym for. You just made me very, very happy. Really? Well, <laughs> that isn't true of many of the people I talk to, but I'm, I'm glad to hear it work with you. <laughs> I am obsessed to understand whether or not we are alone or not? That's a good question. And, and that's, that's the question that the SETI Institute, among other, other organizations, addresses. That's what we're trying. We're trying to answer that question. We don't have an answer yet. It, uh, what, it, what is the closest you've come to answering that question? Or is that a silly question? Well, yeah, in the sense that it's a silly question in the sense that you don't know whether you're close, right? This is like uh, Chris Columbus sailing across the North Atlantic. He didn't know whether he was close to finding another continent, even though he wasn't thinking about finding another continent. I mean, there was no way he could know that he was close. It either happened or it didn't. And that's pretty much the story of this, the experiments that we run to try and find uh, some, some cosmic company out there. So what, what kind of stuff do you guys do? Like, what kind of experiments do you do? Well, when you think about it, uh, anybody who's seen the movie Contact kind of knows what we do. Uh, we uh, actually have uh, big radio antennas, and we try and eavesdrop on signals that might be being sent by some uh, cosmic neighbors. And we also look for flashing laser lights, too. So we, so far, have limited ourselves to looking for signals, signals that would betray the presence of somebody else. And do you think that, uh, this may be another silly question, but do you think we are alone? No, no, I don't. I mean, <laughs> astronomy will tell you that uh, that would be a, a rather a radical point of view, right? We now know something we didn't know 25 years ago. We now know that uh, planets are very common and the number of planets in our galaxy is about a trillion, trillion. Uh, and there are 200 billion other galaxies we can see, each other trillion planets. So to think that, well, this is the only planet where you have, you know, biology and even intelligent life, uh, that would be kind of self-centered. And usually in science, when you think you're special, you're wrong. So, so, so then why is it that we haven't been able to find anyone or anything? <clears throat> Yeah, well, I, I think that that's mostly the tyranny of distance more than anything else, right? We've we've been looking for somebody else uh, since 1960, although the experiments are very much different than they were then. Uh, but, you know, that's not a very long period of time. We haven't looked in many places because it's, it's, it's a very slow process. So we haven't uh, tried to eavesdrop on signals from more than about 5,000 star systems. 5,000 sounds like a lot, but it's actually not. And uh, so if somebody were to ask me, as you just did, you know, why haven't we found ET? I would say that the answer is we haven't really looked hard enough. It's like going to, you know, Treasure Island in the South Pacific and you use a teaspoon and you dig up a couple of uh, spoon- spoonfuls of sand somewhere. But that doesn't mean that, you, you know, there's no buried treasure. It means you haven't found it. Uh, and w- you you strike me as being extremely passionate about what you do, which of well, course who wouldn't be if they were if they you know if you're looking for for alien life forms. Well, that's right. I mean, it is an interesting question. It's it's something if you do find somebody, right? Uh, that would be something that would be, if you will, in the history books forever, right? It's it's kind of like 
discovering the Americas with the Europeans did. Of course, <laughs> the Americas have been populated long before, but nonetheless, some things like that are kind of inflection points for humanity because now you know that well you're you're pretty nifty and all that but you know you're not the only kid on the block you're not the only game in town have you ever thought about what you would do if you walked into work one day and you found extraterrestrial life like what you would do you well, how would you feel yeah well i actually we kind of know that already because we've had some false alarms uh it's been a while now it's been two decades 25 years, actually, since the last really impressive false alarm. But it was impressive. Uh, for most of a day, we thought we had found a signal that was the kind we're looking for. And, uh, you know, if we'd had a red phone, I suppose we would have called the White House. But you don't have a red phone. And I don't know that the White House would have taken the call. But at least, as I say, for, for most of a day, we thought this might be it. And that was a very interesting little experiment, even though it turned out that it was just a satellite that we were picking up. Um, it, it was interesting in that it showed what happens if the experiment succeeds. And uh, everybody, well, I personally got very nervous about it all because I realized all the meetings and whatever else I had scheduled for the next week were going to become irrelevant. But beyond that, it was just a very unsettled time. Eventually, uh, the New York Times called me up and they, they were asking about the signal. So, uh, you know, we, we've run that experiment. And what happens is that at first, there's, it's a confused situation. Then you call up somebody at another observatory, presumably in another country, and ask them to verify things. This all would take a couple of days. And after a couple of days, if it's a real signal and is confirmed, then, you know, obviously, it's going to be a big story. But it turns out, that the media are calling you right from the beginning. So it's a big story right from the beginning. So they know immediately. Um, and what inspired you to kind of, I'm assuming you dedicated your life to this. No, that's not true. Actually, oh. I've had lots of jobs, but, okay. but, uh, but I've been doing this one for a long time now. So, and, and what was it that made you kind of want to go down this road? Well, I've always been interested in aliens, and I think that that was simply uh, the consequence of having gone to a lot of movies when I was a kid, which featured aliens. Uh, the aliens mostly come to Earth, uh, you know, bent on destruction. Normally, they start with Los Angeles, they flatten that, and then uh, by that point, the U.S. Air Force gets involved and manages to hold off these creatures that have come from who knows how many light years away and obviously are, are very far advanced with respect to us when it comes to technology. But nonetheless, we seem to be able to win. I don't know, I never understood that. But uh, there are aliens. And uh, I liked aliens when I was a kid because, doggone it, you know, they were great bad guys. And now, for the first time, really, in human history, we have enough technology and enough science that we can actually conduct a, a real experiment to see if we can find anything. And have you ever seen an alien? Well, well, no. If I had, I, I'd have job security, right? We, we haven't found them yet. You would know that. But have you ever met someone who has seen an alien and who you believe has seen an alien? No, but a lot of people, I, I get emails, phone calls from people all the time uh, who have seen something. Uh, at least three people claim they were aliens. Others have claimed to see them. But uh, none of that has been terribly convincing. It does tell you that there's a certain fraction of the populace that needs additional help. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm just, I'm just really, I've always been fascinated by, by, by stars, by space. Um, and I just, I can't fathom the size of what is out there. I mean, some of the things that you just said, like billions and trillions and, how is it possible that there isn't life? How is it possible that, that we are alone? Actually, you know what? I read a book once that said, if we are alone, that's profound. And if we're not alone, it's profound. So the both, both answers to the question are profound. Yeah, that's right. That, that's a quote, actually, from somebody whose name escapes me at the moment. But yeah, well, that's right. But, you know, having said that, where do you go from there? I mean... <laughs> It's profound, but so what? I mean, what it, how does that affect what you do? And uh, at this point, you can say, well, it probably doesn't. But you try and 
run the best experiment you can to try and find things. But this is not a falsifiable premise. This is not like, uh, for example, the prediction that there's a particle called the Higgs boson, right? That was a prediction made by a theoretician. And you could falsify it because it, that prediction said something about what it was you were looking for. And if you could search for that whatever characteristic and not find it, then you could say, well, look, it, it, it seems that this hypothesis is just baloney. It isn't true. But in the case of the hypothesis that there are aliens out there, there's really no experiment you can do to falsify it. You can't prove they're not there. The only thing you can do is to prove that they are there. And so, you know, you just have to accept that. So, so, so proving that they are there is clearly proving to be quite difficult. What would make it easier for us? Like what technological invention that's within the realms of plausibility would make it easier for us to figure out whether or not there are aliens out there or not? Yeah. Uh, well, I don't think we're, we're, we're stymied, stymied by technology so much. Uh, this, this kind of work requires, requires a lot of compute power, that's for sure. But computers keep getting uh, faster. And, uh, you know, at, the, at any given price point, a computer, the computers will double in speed every two years. That's known as Moore's Law. You know, Gordon Moore was one of the co-founders of Intel, which is just down the street here in the Silicon Valley. Uh, and that's true. And so the search keeps getting faster and faster because of the improvements in computer technology. But it isn't the case that if you just had, you know, X millions of dollars and through that, at the project that you could guarantee you were going to find something. And that's why funding is always an issue in SETI. It's always a matter of the money, because after all, the government isn't giving us any money. So it's a, it's a matter of private individuals who think, well, they can't promise me that if I give them this amount of money, they'll find something. But on the other hand, maybe they will. So that's kind of the situation. So, you, so, so there's not like, again, I, I'm not a scientist, Clearly. So there's not like something like nuclear fusion powered rockets that could take you further and faster that would help? Or is it the distances are just so insane that whatever we create, we won't get to where we need to be? Yeah. Well, we're not going to find them by going and visiting, trying to visit them, uh, even nuclear fusion rockets aside. There's nothing you can do that'll get you there fast enough that you won't be dead long before you ever get anywhere. And if you get to a planet and there's nobody there, what do you do? You rock it off and do that again, right? It's, it's much easier to find them, you know, <laughs> where we are here on Earth with, by using you know, telescopes. That's, that's, that's the way to do it. I mean, it's pretty much like saying, you know, to talk to the Native Americans, 1600, well, no, make it 1400. And they say, you know, there's all this water in front of you. They call it the Atlantic. Do um, you think there's anybody on the other side of that? They say, well, I mean, maybe, I mean, who knows, right? And they weren't going to discover that by putting a raft into the waters and, you know, trying to get to the other side. It required, you know, technology that they didn't have to do that. Uh, but, you know, the possibility that they might be walking along the beach sometime and find a bottle with a note in it. I mean, you know, that wasn't zero, that possibility. So that would be the easy way to find it and lower budget, too. <laughs> have we sent any bottles out to space? We have. We have uh, some deliberate transmissions have been made uh, beginning in the 1970s, actually. But on the other hand, you know, some people think that's a dangerous thing to do. You're alerting aliens. You don't know anything about their uh, their inclinations, their 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 motives, what they might do. They might just launch, a, you know, a, a flotilla of weaponry and you know, flatten the entire Earth. It would be interesting a project for them. Um, but so so some people say we shouldn't broadcast anything into space, but we're broadcasting into space anyhow. Television and radar, they all go straight out into space. And any, any uh, other uh, society that has the wherewithal to build really big antennas could pick that stuff up and they would know somebody's here on Earth. So isn't that what we do to get their attention? Like what are the experiments in, in a very simplistic way, what are the experiments that we are doing, you are doing, to try and get people or aliens or whatever to hear us? Yeah, well, we're not doing any of that, actually. We're just listening, we're just listening. Uh, not because of the danger aspect of it. I mean, some people will tell you that that's what's keeping them from broadcasting, but 
in general, that's not it. It's, it's simply that if you broadcast, suppose you aim a signal at a nearby star system, uh, you know, it might be 100 light years away. Well, that means that signal is going to spend 100 years getting to that uh, star system. If there's somebody there paying attention, they hear it, and they decide to respond by saying, hey, great to get in touch with you guys. You want to join our book club, whatever. You know, that'll take another 100 years to get back to us. So 200 years have gone by, and the people who really thought about this, you know, they're long gone. So, you know, from a very pragmatic point of view, it's simpler just to listen. It's listen because... You know, you might find that signal tonight, as it were, as opposed to 200 years from now. So is it possible that we've already made contact with them and they're just making contact with us and we just haven't heard back from them yet? Uh, well, it's possible that somebody uh, has picked up, you know, leakage radiation, say uh, the BBC, uh, that they've picked that up. And, uh, you know, I don't know what they're doing with it. I mean, it's even conceivable that some of them have responded to it and said, you know, we want more top 40 programming or whatever. Um, but, you know, all of that is nice to talk about at dinner, but it does, doesn't help you with the experiment much. <laughs> so I have a question that's pretty much impossible to answer, but I like asking it anyway. How is it possible, and what on earth is going on, that there is a universe with billions and trillions of of stars and billions of universes and gagillions of, of galaxies. What on earth is happening? How did this happen? What is happening? I know you can't answer it, but I keep on wanting someone to be able to answer it. Yeah. Well, you keep asking what on earth, but it, the, the answer is not on earth. Uh, the, <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, the history of the universe is actually one of the topics, really the principal research area that the James Webb Space Telescope, which, you know, is sending back its first pictures now, uh, was designed to learn because it can look way back in time and, uh, you know, see what the universe looked like when it was just a baby, really. Uh, and that tells you at least the story of what happened. But it began in a big bang, right? 13.4 billion years ago, whatever is the latest number on that. And you, you can ask, well, wait a minute, what was there before the big bang? was? Why was there ever a big bang. I mean, why? And the answer to that is we don't know the answer to that. <laughs> I mean, that's that's more philosophy, maybe religion than it is science, because all you can say is that if you had, a, you know, just a unit, you just had nothing. It turns out that even in a vacuum, nature likes to make particles and things like that, and maybe even big bangs. But it only begs the question of, well, wait a minute, why did you have this big empty space in the first place? So you know, in the in the end, you're you're talking philosophy. Yeah, and it's it's always impossible to answer that. Yes, uh, and it seems like I've actually been to India a few times and spoken to a few uh, wise men and women, let's say, and they always have an answer, but I don't understand what they're talking about. Like they'll yeah. say something that d just is beyond my understanding. So I still don't have anyone that has been able to answer that question. Which is anyway, it is what yeah. it is. Well, I mean, if they, if. It, <laughs> Maybe they should publish their answers in the Astrophysical Journal and see if uh, their papers get by the referees. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think it would. So uh, a couple of a couple of days ago, someone was talking to me about the the the, the moon Europa. You know yes. Europa. Yes. And they were they were saying to me that Europa is a perfect place for life. Is that true? Well, it depends on what. <laughs> it wouldn't be great for you know hippos or. Uh, or uh, ground squirrels or anything like that. But Europa, it, it, it looks like a bright ping pong ball. But if you can see detail, you see that the surface is all cracked. It's covered with ice. And it's, you know, it's not uh, two inches of ice. It's actually like maybe 20 or 30 miles worth of ice. But underneath that ice, that solid ice on the surface, is water. We know there's an ocean there. The experiments to, to determine that are interesting if you're a scientist. But in any case, we know that underneath all that ice is an ocean on this moon, which is about the same size as our own moon, by the way, uh, an ocean that is like, you know, 60 miles deep. There's twice as much water on Europa as there is on the Earth, and the Earth has a lot of water. So that water, of course, is very dark down there. No sunlight can get to it. And there's no plants on the surface that are, you know, decaying and putting debris into that ocean. So the question is, that ocean's been sitting there for more than 4 billion years. Has anything cooked up in that ocean? And, you know, it, it's possible. It's possible. We won't know until we go there and sort of drill down and 
sample the water. But if there is life on Europa, yeah, it's life, but it'll be single-celled life. So you'll need a microscope to see it. And for a lot of people, that isn't as exciting as finding aliens that can look at you and abduct you for breeding experiments. Of course, it's not as exciting. But if there is amoebic life, that's still life. And that's proof that we're not alone. Well, indeed. It show, indeed, you're absolutely right. It, 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 it shows that life is not some sort of very uh, improbable thing, some sort of miracle, right? That if I, I mean, what it will tell you is that if I give you a, a million planets like Earth, a lot of them are going to have life. Now, the question of whether they have intelligent life is another discussion point, if you will, because after all, that's not guaranteed. Nature doesn't seem to be terribly interested in intelligence, something I notice every time I walk around the neighborhood. I mean, it's, it's you know, <laughs> you won't necessarily find it. Uh, the dinosaurs were around for 150 million years. They didn't get very smart. And so, you know, again, whether you get intelligence just because you have life, that's an open question. Yes, indeed. Walking around the neighborhood these days sometimes is a tough one. Um, I have, I have, a, I have, a, I have a question, an interesting question. Um, how do you think Earth and humanity in particular would change if we had categorical proof that there was intelligent life out there? Yeah. Uh, well, a lot of people have sat around and thought about that, written books about it, and occasionally organized conferences about it. But I, th I think it's kind of hard to tell because what you usually look for when you try and answer that question is an historical precedent, right? You say, okay, this is a comparable situation in history that it was would be similar to the situation of, you know, finding ET, and there really isn't anything except, you know, maybe maybe when uh, Charles Darwin, you know, writes uh, the Origin of Species, and it turns out that humans are just another animal in a long line of animals. Right, we're descended from uh, this kind of critter and that kind of critter. I mean, that wouldn't affect you terribly much if your job was to, uh, you know, I don't know, mow lawns or, uh, <laughs> you know, give, give shoe shines at the the railway station. Say, but on the other hand, it it is philosophically important, right? Because you know something important about why you're here, right? And so, if you were to find ET, uh, that would show right away that. A, life is not particularly rare. And secondly, intelligence is obviously not so rare. And that means that, you know, you share the universe with a whole bunch of clever beings, probably most of which are more advanced than you are, because Homo sapiens has only been around for 300,000 years, which is very short compared to the age of the universe. So presumably there are societies out there composed of uh, intellects, whether they're biological or not that could be literally billions of years more advanced than we are. So I, I don't know that that affects you in your daily job, but it's certainly interesting to know. You know, I think, I think about that all the time. I think about how perspectives would change when or if we knew that there was something out there and something intelligent. And I always think back to that image of Earth that the, the astronauts took. In that moment when you saw, when we saw our home, perspectives changed. But at the same time, people still continued to kill each other. So I'm not sure perspectives changed enough. Yeah, well, <laughs> I think you raised an interesting point because uh, some of my colleagues, uh, I think they're maybe a little more naive than the rest of us. But, you know, they say, well, if we were to find ET, suddenly we would realize we on this planet, we're all homo sapiens, right? Well, the smart hominids walking around and that will, that our, you know, differences, our conflicts and so forth will all seem pretty petty compared to the fact that we're in this universe of a lot of life and some intelligent life and that we'll all start to sing Kumbaya and get along. Um, that would be, <laughs> that'd be good. I suppose that would be good, but I don't see it happening. I don't think it would make terribly much difference. Uh, any more than, you know, Charles Darwin, hey, you know, we're just another animal. Oh, well, now we can stop fighting one another. And that's sort of thing. well, that didn't happen. So I don't know that that, you know, I, I, I'm not memorizing the lyrics to Kumbaya, if there are any. <laughs> I think it's Kumbaya, my Lord, Kumbaya. And that's all I know. Oh, yeah. But um, I think that's the total, the, the total content of the lyrics. Yes. Oh, is it? <laughs> 
Well, look, man, it's been a real pleasure. Um, you're clearly very uh, passionate about what you do. And I hope, I hope that this uh, podcast brings you luck and that the moment it comes out, the next day you find alien life and they don't come down and destroy us. Well, I, I, I don't live in Los Angeles, so I'm not quite so worried as I might otherwise be. It's been my pleasure <laughs> talking to you, Leon. Okay, thanks so much. Hello everyone, it's Leon here, AKA The Kindness Guy. If you like my videos, which I hope you do, don't forget to press the subscribe button and also to ring the little bell so that the notifications notify you that I have a new video out in the world.